This is a video of free response question number two from the 2018 AP Physics C mechanics exam. In this problem, two carts are on a horizontal level track of negligible friction. Cart one has a sensor that measures the force exerted on it during a collision with cart two, which has a spring attached. Cart one is moving with a speed of three meters per second toward cart number two, which is at rest as shown in the figure above. The total mass of cart 1 and the force sensor is half a kilogram. The mass of cart 2 is 1.05 kilograms and the spring has negligible mass. The spring has a spring constant of 130 newtons per meter. The data for the force the spring exerts on cart 1 are shown in the graph below. A student models these data as a quadratic fit with this function here. F equals 3200 times t squared minus 500 times t. In part a of this problem, we're supposed to use integral calculus to calculate the total impulse delivered to cart 1 during the collision. And if you remember that the total impulse, if you're ever trying to find that using this type of information, is equal to the integral of f dt then you should be able to recognize that all we need to solve this is the equation that was given in the setup of the problem and the graph. And we need both of those because in order to determine what the time limits are on the integral, I need to look at the graph. It looks like um, the cart experiences a force from time t equals zero until about time 0 0.16 seconds. So that looks like the maybe the interval over which uh, the, the collision occurs. And so that will be the lower and upper limits of my integral. So 0 to 0 0.16. And I should also plug in the force equation that was used to model these data in the graph. So 3200 t squared minus 500 t dt. When I actually perform this integral, I need to remember that the exponents of the, the t variables will increase, right? So uh, maybe I can perform the, the first term there. This integral would be 3,200 over 3 times t cubed, right? When I, if I were to take the derivative of what I just wrote, I would end up with the 3,200 t squared because the 3 would come down and cancel with the 3 in the denominator and then I would remove 1 from the exponent on the t. And for the next term uh, I would get just 250 t squared. Right? Again if I take the derivative of that 250 t squared the 2 would come down. 2 times 250 gives me the 500 and when I remove 1 from the exponent I would have just t. And so that needs to be evaluated at 0 0.16 and at 0 and subtract those two terms in order to find the impulse that cart 1 experiences during this collision. So in order to actually go ahead and carry that out what we would have is 3200 divided by 3 times 0 0.16 cubed minus 250 times 0 0.16 squared minus, right, this is me plugging in 0 0.16 everywhere, uh, minus uh, 0 plugged in for t. So it would essentially be minus 0, right? And so uh, when I go through and carry out all of those calculations, I'm left with an impulse, j, of about minus 2.03 newton seconds. And that should make some sense. Uh, that the impulse would be negative because when I look at the graph the impulse occurs below the time axis the force is negative. In part BI I'm asked to calculate the speed of cart 1 after the collision and I think the easiest way for us to do that is to remember that impulse is also equal to the change in momentum and so if we write the right side of this equation as the mass of cart 1 times the change in velocity of cart 1, 
I think we'll be able to calculate the velocity of the cart after the collision because we've already done the hard part. We've already calculated what the impulse must be uh, in, in part A from that graph. And so I'm going to solve this equation for the velocity of cart 1 after the collision. I'll start by writing J equals M1 times V1 final minus V1 initial. Right, so the variable we're looking for is V1 final, the speed of cart 1 after the collision. So I'll go ahead and I will divide both sides by M1 and then add V1 initial to both sides. And that will give me V1 final is equal to the impulse divided by M1 plus the cart's initial speed, V1 initial. And so when I make those substitutions, the impulse was negative 2.03 newton seconds. The mass of cart 1 was half a kilogram. And the initial speed of cart 1 is 3. And it was moving to the right. So uh, here, which should be the velocity of cart 1, right, uh, can be made positive. And so when I go to actually calculate the final velocity of cart 1, I you know, do negative 2.03 divided by half a kilogram, add on the 3, and my result is negative 1.06 meters per second, which actually means when this collision occurs, after the collision, after the impulse or change in momentum experienced by cart 1, it's going to be moving to the left because the final velocity of cart 1 is negative after the collision. And just as I've said that, if we look at part BII or part B2, in which direction does cart 1 move after the collision, it's asking us exactly that question, right? By looking at the final velocity that we just calculated in part BI, we know that because the velocity is negative, cart 1 will move to the left after the collision. And this is a rare case where we're not asked to justify in any way um, what our selection is here. We just need to put that check mark next to left. And now here in part C, we're asked some similar questions, but now we're being asked about cart 2. So here, first, we need to calculate the speed of cart 2 after the collision. And I think the key thing to notice about this is that because there are no external forces in this collision between cart 1 and cart 2, then the linear momentum of the, the two-cart system should be conserved. And another way of thinking about that is the change in momentum of cart 1 plus the change in momentum of cart 2 should be equal to 0. And another way of saying that is the change in momentum of cart 1 is equal and opposite to the change in momentum of cart 2. And so what was the change in momentum of cart 1? Well, that's the same thing as the impulse that we calculated on that previous slide. And so the change in momentum of cart 1, delta P1, is negative 2.03. And that is equal to the change, equal to minus the change in momentum of cart 2, and we could write that as the mass of cart 2 times the change in velocity of cart 2, which would be V2 final minus V2 initial. And so we need to solve this equation for the final velocity of cart 2. And we do that in the same kind of way, right? V2 final would be equal to, well, I could divide by minus m2 on both sides, and then add v2 initial to both sides. And when I do that, I get minus 2.03 divided by minus m2 plus v2 initial equals. And what I would need to do here is plug in the value of m2, which is 0 0.5 kilograms, and also plug in the initial speed of cart 2, which is 0. And so ultimately, I would be doing 2.03 divided by the mass of cart 2, which was 1.05 kilograms. And I'm left with a final speed of cart 2, 
that is equal to 1.93 meters per second. The negative signs in this equation cancel, which means that the velocity of CART2 is positive after the collision, meaning it would move to the right, and that makes perfect sense. In part C2, we're asked to show that the collision between CARTs 1 and 2 is elastic. And for that, we need to remember what is the defining characteristic for an elastic collision. And we must remember that an elastic collision is one where energy is conserved. And so the initial kinetic energy of CART 1 should be equal to the kinetic energies of CART 1 and 2 after the collision. And the way that I could write that down in equation form is the kinetic energy of CART 1 initially should be equal to the kinetic energy of CART 1 finally plus the kinetic energy of CART 2 finally. And so now we've got a bunch of numbers to plug in, right? Initially, uh, or I guess in general, the kinetic energy equations are 1 half mv squared, right? So we need to have three different terms, 1 half mv squared, plugging in the correct masses and the correct uh, velocities in each case. So on the left-hand side, I would have 1 half times the mass of cart 1, which is half a kilogram, times the velocity of cart 1 before the collision, which was 3. And on the right-hand side of the equation, I have two terms. The first term would be 1 half times the mass of cart 1 times the velocity of cart 1 after the collision. And when we calculated that up in part B, we found that the velocity of cart 1 after the collision was 1.06 meters per second. And now that was negative, but in the kinetic energy equation, the uh, sign and the velocity doesn't matter because we square that velocity. And now for the last term, we have 1 half times the mass of CART2, which was 1.05 kilograms, times the velocity of CART2 after the collision, which was 1.93. We just calculated that up above. And so now we're trying to show mathematically that the two sides of this equation are equivalent. And when we do this math, we're going to come out with two different numbers. One for the left side of the equation, which I believe comes out to be 2.25 joules. And one for the right side of the equation. And after I calculate both of those two terms and add them up together, I get 2.24 joules. And the argument here is, the only difference between those two numbers is very small, and so it must have been from some rounding error. And so these two sides of the equation, while not perfectly equal, are essentially equal because we've done some rounding and the numbers are already very close together. So we've essentially, essentially shown that the kinetic energy in this collision is conserved. And lastly, in part D, we're asked to first calculate the speed of the center of mass of the two-cart spring system. And we can do this by writing the velocity of the center of mass is equal to the total momentum of the system at any particular moment in time, whether it's before or after the collision, divided by the total mass of the system. And so the total mass of the system would be the 0 0.5 kilograms plus 1.05 kilograms. So 1.55 kilograms in the denominator is the total mass. And in the numerator, we should just pick the easiest point to calculate the total momentum, which would probably be before the collision even occurs. After the collision, both carts are moving, so it's a little bit more difficult to calculate the total momentum. But before the collision occurs, only cart 1 is moving, and so the total momentum of the system is only in cart 1. So to calculate that total momentum, I would have the mass of cart 1 times the velocity of cart 1 before the collision. And that would be 3 times 0 0.5. So that's 1.5 divided by 1.55. 
And so in order to calculate the velocity of the center of mass, we set up an equation like this. Finally, we do 1.5 divided by 1.55. That's going to be an answer slightly less than 1. The velocity of the center of mass of the two-cart spring system is 0 0.97 meters per second. And now the last task of this question is to calculate the maximum elastic potential energy that's stored in the spring. When cart 1 hits cart 2, the spring becomes compressed and there's elastic potential energy stored in that spring. We would calculate that as U equals 1 half kx max, the maximum compression of the spring, squared. At the very beginning of the problem, we were given k, the spring constant of that spring. K is equal to 130 newtons per meter. So our only job here is to try to determine what x max would be, so that way we can plug in the numbers and calculate that maximum elastic potential energy. The maximum stretch of that, or compression of that spring occurs when the spring is experiencing the maximum force. And so some of the information we'll need is related to that equation that was used to fit the data at the very beginning of the problem and that graph. And so if we sort of think back to that equation that was given to us, the force as a function of time equation, which was 3,200 times t squared minus 500t. Again, that was given at the beginning of the problem. Because uh, this is a quadratic equation, the maximum force would occur when the derivative of this equation is equal to zero. So let's calculate that maximum force. F max is when df dt is equal to zero. And so let's take the derivative of this equation. 3200 times 2 gives me 6400 t minus 500. So now let's calculate the time at which the spring is experiencing a maximum force. That time, t, would be equal to 500 divided by 6400. And this comes out to be a time of about 0.078 seconds. And if we know at what time the spring is experiencing a maximum force, what we can do is plug that time back into the force equation that we started with at the very beginning of the problem. And when we plug in 0 0.078 seconds into that force equation, what we get for F max comes out to be somewhere around negative 19.5 newtons. And so now we know the maximum force. So how can we use the maximum force here and the spring constant here to calculate the maximum displacement of that spring? The way that we'll do that is using Hooke's Law. F equals minus kx. So, of course, the maximum stretch of that spring, x max, will occur at the maximum force, which we've just calculated, divided by minus k. And we will get a positive answer here, which is equal to 19.5 divided by 130. And so x max occurs at about 0 0.15 meters. And this number is the number we've been searching for this whole time. This 0 0.15 meters is the maximum compression of the spring. And now we can go back to our elastic potential energy equation that we started with. U equals 1 half times K, which is 130 newtons per meter, times X max, which is 0 0.15 squared. And we finally arrive at the maximum potential energy stored in that spring, which is approximately 1.5 joules.